I'm really pleased to introduce our first speaker for the seminar series. This is, uh, it's always great to kick off the series with a highlight. And I think everyone can really appreciate how special the lakes of the Sierra are. Anyone who's been hiking up in the high Alpine lakes um, knows that it's just a, a, a magical environment. And Dr. John Milak has spent a large part of his career working in the Sierra as well as lakes all over the world. So he's in the field of limnology, which is the study of lakes. And tonight he's gonna to be talking about lakes and watersheds in the Sierra Nevada and the responses to environmental change. John is a distinguished professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. His research emphasizes ecological processes in lakes, wetlands, and streams, and hydrological and biogeochemical aspects of catchments. And he's conduct, conducted multi-year studies in Eastern Africa, the Amazon, the Pantanal of South America, and in lakes and watersheds within the Sierra Nevada and coastal California. John's really an expert in this realm, and uh, I'm also sort of happy to say that it's looking very good that we'll have John back here at Snarl in the near future working on uh, Mono Lake again. So that's really exciting for all of us up here. So um, John, it's my great pleasure to let you take it away. Thanks, Carol, for those remarks. And let me start screen sharing here. <clears throat> all righty. So let me welcome you, you all, some of the classes from Santa Barbara, the Dartmouth class, the Redlands University class, some of the people I met last week, this weekend at the VFR event. So anyway, everybody should be, I'm sorry I can't see you in person for sure, like Carol said, but we'll do the best we can. So I've, I've mixed pictures and data and some concepts, so we'll make this into com a combination of a tutorial and some uh, natural history. This first picture actually is, I picked it purposely because it's the watershed of the best studied lake in California at high elevation. Obviously other lakes are well studied at lower elevation, but this is the watershed of Emerald Lake in Sequoia National Park. And we'll come back to this several times in the course of this um, lecture. Okay. Let's make my, there we go. So I'm, this is a, a general comment on, you know, one of the, some of the things that we think about when we look at the High Sierra Lakes as an example of ecological systems that are responding to various kinds of environmental stressors, you might say. Um, today, I'm gonna talk mostly about how atmospheric inputs of both water and, and chemicals might affect these lakes, and a bit about how climate changes are affecting them, or at least, variability in climate. Another uh, factor that has been pervasively effective over the, over the last century or more is invasive species. <clears throat> and that topic is one I'm not gonna be covering tonight. I think you've had other lectures on my role in NAP on this subject, but I just wanna remind you that there's a suite of environmental issues that do impact the Sierra and we only are gonna deal with a subset of those today. Um, more specifically, um, again, a, the same sort of image, a satellite image showing um, the state of California, part of the state of Nevada. The Sierra Nevada run about 700 kilometers from a, a little bit north of Tahoe down to the Kern um, Valley in, in the south. And as we move south, and of course here's Lake Tahoe, you see Mono Lake, you pass through um, Long Valley Caldera. And you know, the high peak region is really sort of between Mono and down toward Mount Whitney. And then as, as you go north and south, the mountains to kind of taper off a bit. But what we consider that in terms of this analysis that I'll be talking about, the high elevation are the lakes that are above about 2,500 meters up to about uh, 4,000 meters. So that's my focus. It's not Lake Tahoe or Mono Lake, it's the smaller lakes that occur in the high elevations throughout the, um, the Sierra Nevada, which of course, as this image shows, in, in a large part of the year is snow covered. And again, we'll talk about, <clears throat> about snow today, but I just want to remind everyone that although, you know, <clears throat> California is famous for, um, you know, the 49ers and the gold and all that good stuff, but 
what really keeps California functional as a state is this white stuff in the Sierra when it melts. That's our water supply to a large extent. And so that's a big issue, of course, that we're facing as climates change. I've also highlighted Emerald Lake again, just to remind you that it's in the Southern Sierra in Sequoia National Park. So just broadly speaking, you know, the, the um, high elevation Sierra lakes are in general fairly small. And I'll show you some data in a minute. They're fairly shallow. They're very dilute. The water is very low in solutes. The water tends to be very clear, features that we all are attracted to. The watersheds, as you see in this picture of uh, this is the Pear Lake Basin. They're, you know, they're largely steep granitic watersheds. So there are places where there's metamorphic rock and volcanic rocks, but a lot of it is granitic, large areas of rock, thin soils, sparse vegetation. And then as we illustrate here on the, on the right side, deep seasonal snow cover. And I really mean deep, and we'll show you some examples of that. Those of you that have any memory of Hollywood movies, perhaps might remember that in the 19, two, sorry, 2003 movie called Hulk, in one scene, he is shown throwing rocks in a rock in a rocky basin. Well, it's this basin right here, the Pear Lake Basin, where that picture was taken, if you're interested in some movie trivia. Now, over the years, of course, we're academics and we publish papers, but um, a couple of years ago, um, three of my colleagues, myself, uh, Steve Sadro, Jim Sikkiman, and Jess Dozier, um, published a book with the University of California Press where we kind of put together all the hydrology, limnology, and aquatic ecology that, that we had done and other people had done in the High Sierra and created this, um, this it's not really a textbook, but it's kind of a, a monograph about the Sierra. And I'm going to use a bit of material from this book today, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention that especially if the students are interested in learning a lot more than I can possibly cover today, this is a short little book of 100 pages or so, which covers um, a lot more issues than I can possibly give you do justice for today. I also want to mention, just for the students in the audience, um, you know, Jeff and I have been professors at uh, UC Santa Barbara since the um, 1970s. And Steve and Jim were both um, PhD students at UCSB with me. And one of, the, one of the things that Jeff and I often talk about is, you know, how do we pick graduate students to work with us on these kind of problems, whether it's snow or limnology in the High Sierra? And, you know, the normal academic credentials, you know, you want somebody who's, you know, smart and has a good background. But that is hardly enough to be able to work at these places. So you need people that are also strong physically, but also have a lot of common sense and know how to deal with things in a remote place. And so how do you find those people? Well, you look at other criteria than just their grades and their GPAs and that kind of stuff. And so an example might be Steve. So Steve Sadro, before he came to work with me, had, had walked as a through hiker the whole Pacific Coast Trail not once, but twice. So that to me is pretty strong evidence that, this, that Steve kind of had his head on his shoulders. At least he was sensible enough and strong enough to be able to do that kind of a thing. So those of you who are thinking about graduate school realize that there's a lot more to graduate school if you work on field sites than just um, reading books. You know, there's a lot of other dimensions required. Okay, the other thing I wanna, you know, this is a bit of a tangent in a way, but I really think it's important when you look at a project that goes on for more than 30 years, there's a lot of people involved. And, you know, so there's four names on this cover of this book, but, but over those years, you know, between Jeff and I and other colleagues, and we've had a lot of graduate students, postdocs, really dedicated laboratory and field technicians, a lot of colleagues, agency staff, people working at Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park, Yosemite, National Forests. All these people have worked in various ways together with us. And you become very good friends usually when you're working under these conditions. And then we've been funded by a lot of sources. You know, the University of California Water Center is a California Air Resources Board. I'm not gonna list all these, but NASA and NSF, for example. So again, 
these are these long-term projects are are hard to maintain because you you don't usually get grants that last 35 years. So you're going through different funding sources, you're working in different sites, but it is truly a, a human endeavor to be able to do this kind of work. Okay, so into the heart of this talk, um, I'm going to divide it into four sections, and I've for a somewhat simplistic um, following, I've used color coding. So I'm going to start out talking about snow and watershed hydrology. Then I'm going to speak about watershed hydrochemistry, a bit of biogeochemistry, then turn to the lake ecology itself, or, this, or limnology, and then end with some discussions about trends in um, climate and how those trends in climate are influencing the ecosystems. Okay, so um, this looks like a funny looking picture, I know, but so in the Southern Sierra, in Sequoia National Park, there's a watershed, it's the upper watershed, the marble fork of the, one of the branches of the Cahuilla River. And it's about um, 20 square kilometers. And, you know, the elevations go from about 20, um, 200 meters above sea level up to about 34 um, 100 meters above sea level. And in that watershed, which is mostly what I showed you pictures of earlier, and I'll show you further pictures, you know, granitic, some vegetation, and then there's a series of lakes. And so this lake number E is Emerald Lake. The one where the movie The Hulk was made is this one here called Pear Lake. But basically, as typically occurs in these Sierra Nevada watersheds, you've got a glacially, scarved, glacially carved valley with some basins deep enough to hold water permanently and other places where there's basically just streams running off. So it's good old snow. I mean, those of us who I just put up in Mammoth myself last weekend and there's still snow there for, for nice, for, for good. It's nice to see snow. At the Emerald Basin, you know, we, we need to know how much snow is, is falling. And this is an example of what um, snow scientists call a snow pit. So a, a number of very strong, dedicated people dug this very large hole in the ground. You can see this two meter high person at the bottom. And then what he's doing is he's taking little segments of snow with the, out, of, out of the side of the, the snow pit, and he's measuring the density of snow all the way down through that pit. And he's also uh, taking samples for chemical analysis. Um, this was a very um, deep snow year, uh, deep snow pit, 1986. Um, but it does give you a sense of how, how much snow can accumulate in the, in the Sierra Nevada. It represents, as this data on the slide show, you know, between 85 and about 95% of the total annual precipitation. So it's a really big deal in the Sierra to characterize how much snow is there. And then as we'll talk about a bit later, how that snow melts and what's in the snow that melts. So besides measuring the, the density or the snow water equivalents in, in a number of snow pits, what varies more, of course, in space is typically the depth of the snow. And so this is another version of that slide I showed you a minute ago showing the Pocopa Valley. And all those dots are where one of our team members measured the snow depth. So those of you that like backcountry spring skiing, this is a pretty cool place to go. Um, now, of course, some of you may know of uh, Tom Painter's uh, Airborne Snow Observatory, where he's taking laser pictures of, of the land surface without snow and then with snow. So he gets a lot more data points than we get by manually doing, uh, putting tubes in the snow. But in, in the in the days this was done, that wasn't available. So um, on an annual basis over the whole time period of these studies, we would go up there with a team of people and we would sample it more intensively in the Emerald Basin and this higher basin here called Topaz and somewhat less so throughout the rest of the basin. But it um, basically the notion is to calculate how much water is on the ground as snow. You need to know the density of the snow snow water equivalents, and then how the what snow is there, how, how deep it is. And then you can calculate the total volume of, of water in these catchments. Now, again, I'm referring back to Jeff Dozier and his students uh, and the study that was 
published by a, a professor at UCLA using technologies and methods that Japanese students developed. Um, not only, of course, do we care about some individual watershed like, uh, like Emerald Lake, but we really care as a state uh, and as individuals, perhaps, about the overall snow in the Sierra. And so what this slightly more complicated slide shows you is an analysis done with um, remote, remote sensing techniques. And just to go through this a little bit more in a little more detail, on the, on the left side, there's a, a, a series of um, an, an image that shows the median snow water equivalents um, for a year, which had, a, had the, uh, roughly the median over a, a 30 year period. Uh, it happened to be the year 2000. And then the, the, co the code at the top shows you the amount of snow water equivalents in that in the Sierra. And so you see the highest values are about two meters. And then depending as you go lower in altitude, it gets down to you know, less than half a meter. But just to give you a little bit of context, um, a meter and a half or two meters of water, if it was falling as rain, is the same amount of rain that generates the Amazon rainforest. So this is a lot of water that lies in these snowpacks as snow and then eventually melts. The other four slides are a little more complicated. They're showing the difference or the anomaly between particular years that are especially low snow years or especially high snow years relative to this median value. And so the main message here is that on a really low snow year, where you see the total, of, total volume of snow calculated for the whole Sierra is only about three cubic kilometers compared to 18 in, the, in, the, in a median year um, versus a really high snow year where we, we've got about 37 cubic kilometers of water in this, in this snowpack. You also can see it based on the in millimeters of snow. So at a really big snow year, the maximum snow depth could be equivalent to three meters of water, 3,000 millimeters. In a really low year, it could be less than half a meter for the, for the whole average Sierra snowpack. So these are big differences, and it's why we really are concerned when we get, like this year, for example, we get a lot less snow than we really would like, because it impacts the agriculture in the Central Valley, it affects the water supply to the city of San Francisco and Los Angeles, as well as the local people that live in the area. So this is mainly, I want to just give you a sense of the, this basic, pro, basic key um, element in our story, water as snow on a smaller scale. And we'll come back and looking at more detail at that in a minute, but then also on a larger scale, looking at the whole Sierra. Okay, so now I'm gonna zero back in on Emerald Lake. This is a sort of 3D composite view showing you looking into the watershed, the lakes in the foreground and the watershed, it's about one, a little over one square square kilometer in area, uh, rises up to about 3,400 meters at the top, and the bottom is about 3,000 meters above sea level. And what we're going to do now is we're going to do a, a hydrological study of how snow and rain and runoff behave in this, what we're going to use as a typical Sierra watershed. A couple of methods. Um, at the outflow of the lake, we installed a device that goes by this somewhat strange name of so it's a weir, it's a V-notch weir. So basically by measuring the height of water behind this um, little structure, we know the cross section, we know the height of the water, we can calculate very accurately how much water is running out of the lake. I'll also mention something that may seem a little off topic, but it's kind of important. To be able to install a device like this and conduct this kind of research in a national park, you really need the the interest and the support of the, national, of the park superintendent and the rangers and the, and the staff. And we were very fortunate at Sequoia National Park to have all of the above. They really saw the value of understanding the resources that they were managing and the value of the research we were doing as a way to help them manage those resources. This isn't always the case, but I should say again, that in the case of especially Sequoia, but also Yosemite, that the, the parks were very supportive of this kind of activity. 
Another kind of data that you need to be, to be able to evaluate how much snow melts and also how much rain comes in are basic meteorological measurements. So here's an example of one of our meteorological towers, um, a little higher up in the basin. Um, and since so much of the snow melt depends on um, how much sunlight there is coming in, one of the key measurements at the top of this tower are light sensors. And of course, you need to know what the wind speeds are, relative humidity, air temperature, and then there's a rain gauge here, which of course isn't doing too much good in the winter. But the main point is to be able to evaluate the hydrology, you need to measure not just the stream flows, but you need to measure how much um, the atmospheric conditions are changing and how much energy is coming in from the sunlight. And when you have these, these data, you can then do a series of calculations and, 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 and measurements to determine what we call a hydrological budget. And so this is, a, again, a, you know, looks like an odd slide. But what we've done here, since remember this, this book we're talking about spans about 35 years of data. So what we're showing you here is a series of um, bar graphs going from 1983 to um, 2016. And in each case, you know, what are the main inputs? Think about a bank account. You know, what goes into your bank account? Your paycheck, maybe tips, okay? Or maybe from your parents, some money. Um, and what goes out? Well, in the case of a, of, a, of a stream, you know, in a lake, the water goes out by the stream discharge and it evaporates or is transpired or it sublimates from the snow. So we've got water vapor leaving as well as water as liquid water leaving. The inputs, like I've been talking about um, momentarily, um, were snow, obviously, and then in the summer, some rain. If you look at these charts, let's say for example, let's look at the bottom one, it's easier to see to start with. So the black is the amount of um, water that's running out the stream. The, the, the vertical cross hatching is water that has evaporated or sublimated. Um, the other side of the coin, um, how much water is coming in, most is from snow, the, the clear bar, and then that cross hatch bar is from rain. As you get into, um, very much lower snow years, like at the top year, 2012, now the rain has contributed, you know, 40% of the water input and the snow is quite low. So these are some of the variations in the hydrology, which has huge impacts for the lake's ecology and of course, downstream water supplies. We can do the same kind of analysis on a larger scale um, and compare now Emerald Lakes watershed, which I've just been talking about, with the, um, the larger Tokopa watershed. And I'm showing you pretty much the same terms, the rain coming in, the snow melt, the snow coming in, the stream outflow, and the loss by evapotranspiration. And then since we're scientists, we look at the difference or the residual and we'd like it to be about zero, meaning that we've captured all the terms in the water balance. And on average, we've done a pretty good job. You know, these watersheds are relatively hard rock, and we can measure pretty well the inputs and the outputs, so we get a pretty good hydrological balance. And again, it just emphasizes one more time the variability of these plots are showing a median and then outliers, and you see, you know, the snow, in the Emerald Lake varies quite a lot. You know, the maximum snow year had over 3,000 millimeters of snow water equivalent. You know, the minimum had about 200. And then the rain varied from about 400 down to almost nothing. So this is what one of the main characteristics I wanna keep reminding you of that we have a huge amount of variability in the hydrological terms, which in turn impact the aquatic ecosystems. And then, of course, the snow melts. And as part of these studies, we, we didn't just study Emerald Lake. We actually had a series of watersheds, all of which we measured all the things I talked about, snow input, rain, stream discharge, and evapotranspiration. And so this plot starts with Emerald Lake in the Southern Sierra. Pear Lake and Topaz are in the same watershed. Ruby and Crystal are uh, near Mammoth Lakes. Uh, Ruby is actually in the Rock Creek Basin. Crystal is just above the city of Mammoth. Spooler is in, on the, just over the crest from Yosemite. 
and Lost Lake is up at Lake Tahoe. And what we're plotting here is how much water is running, at how much snow melt is occurring, what the stream discharge is. And the basic pattern isn't too surprising. Um, the slightly lower elevation lakes like Emerald and Pear start to melt a little sooner than higher elevation lakes like Topaz or Ruby. And as you go further north, um, the melt starts a little bit later. But this particular year, which was um, 1993, was a pretty big snow year. And so the snow melt period ran for a long time. You know, it started in um, late April and it went into September. And in terms of California, going to a little aside here, in terms of California water supply, in many ways, you know, although we have built reservoirs, in some ways the snowpack is, is just like, is like a natural reservoir because it lets the water come down more gradually. Whereas when it rains, the runoff is much more rapid. So this, this transition that we're seeing at somewhat lower altitudes of more rain, less snow, has a huge impact on how water gets delivered to downstream environments. And this is kind of a nice example of how, how long, in fact, the snow can, can gradually melt from these high elevation systems. So besides looking at how much water is there, we really need to know what's in that water. And so um, the snow being an important input of water might, must also be an important input of other things, you could say. And so this picture, um, those of you that know Dan Dawson, he's in the foreground and he's wearing gloves and he's being very careful because the Sierra Nevada snow is basic. If you melt this snow, it's basically like, like distilled water. It has essentially no solutes in it. It is really pure. Um, those of you that like to drink snow melt, add something to it. <laughs> because drinking distilled water isn't good for you. Um, now there are other, there are some trace elements in it. And so we know we using high performance chemical methods, we, we can measure, well, in this case, we're looking at nutrients like ammonium and nitrate, which potentially impact uh, the, the, the growth of algae in the lakes. And these numbers, these units are called micromoles per liter. But take my word, these are very low, very low numbers. The Sierra snow is about the cleanest snow you can find anywhere in the world. Why would that be? Well, I mean, we've got a big state just to the east, I'm sorry, just to the west, um, cities, agriculture. But remember that most of our, our precipitation in the winter comes out of the North Pacific, rather the Southern Pacific, and, well, sorry, the, um, the tropical Pacific or the, or the Central Pacific. And that air out there is very clear, it's clean. So what actually lands in the Sierra snow tends to be very clean in terms of chemistry. pH is a little bit below um, what you might get theoretically from dissolving CO2 in air um, in water, but it's not, it's not acidic in, 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 a, in, a prob, in a difficult, worrying sense. Okay, so we've got snow, chemistry, very dilute, large volumes of water. What happens in the summer? Well, it does rain sometimes. This picture is from the in Sequoia National Park looking west over the Central Valley. You can sort of see if you look, if you sort of squint, there's a layer, um, somewhat less clean looking air at the, in the valley floor. When it does rain in the summer, the um, solutes are washed out and they tend to be convective storms. What's in the foreground is a rain gauge, which opens only when it rains. So we get just rain, not dust. And in fact, the, the rain chemistry has about 10 times as much um, solute dissolved in it than the snow. So we've got a pretty big seasonal difference, even though small amounts of rain, but if you have 10 times more solutes and 10 times less water, you end up with a similar amount of input from rain and snow. It's a ballpark number. The other thing that happens when we have a long dry season in the Sierra is we have um, dust particles. And the sample of those is, is quite different. So here's an example where we have a pumping system that's pulling air in, and it's in this, this stack of um, little um, plates over here are collecting different sizes of particles. And then we measure on those particles, in this case, we were measuring phosphorus compounds, but you can measure other things. But in a a semi-arid climate, a Mediterranean climate like the Sierra, the summer dry season is an important um, input as well. 
And unfortunately, we've had recent um, massive fires around the Sierra, into the Sierra. Those bring a lot of material as, as particles, which are then deposited on lakes and on watersheds. And there's been some recent work on that topic in particular. But again, the main message is that the inputs of, of nutrients and other uh, chemical species come in three different ways. They come in as snow, rain, dissolved in rain, and as particles. And so to understand what's coming into these watersheds, you need to consider all, all three. And so this is one example of that, hopping back to the Emerald Lake catchment. Um, these are average numbers, but this gives you a relative sense of things. So if we're looking at phosphorus and nitrogen, and I mentioned these two elements because they're both important nutrients. They affect the um, nutrient driven growth of the um, algae and plants in the lakes. So they affect the lake ecology, the lake productivity. And what this slide shows you pretty clearly is that the phosphorus input comes from both, you know, the total deposition is winter snow and, and summer rain dissolved, but also a lot of dry deposition in the dry season. Whereas nitrogen, although some comes in through dry deposition, the vast majority comes in in, um, in snow itself or in dissolved in rainwater. So we've got two very different routes of, of um, supply of these two really important elements, nitrogen and phosphorus. And those of you that are interested in nutrient chemistry and phytoplankton, um, we have a whole section in that uh, book I started talking about, about how these things behave. Although today I'm not gonna go into that particular topic. All right. Continuing on with our green labels, um, looking at some um, more aspects of how the lakes respond to uh, chemical input. Remember, um, maybe you don't remember, but some of you might remember, um, in the um, 1980s, uh, the, the concern nationally and internationally uh, about what was called acid rain. It was water and rain particularly, but also snow that was contaminated with sulfuric acid and nitric acid. And it was causing a lot of damage to lakes in New England, parts of the upper Midwest in the US, parts of Southern Canada, and in Scandinavia in Europe. And in California, you know, there, there was some concern given what I've been telling you how dilute the lakes are how little chemist, chemical composition is in the snowpack, that since we do have an industrialized um, state to the, to the west and lots of agricultural activity as well, there was concern, which then turned up, turned up being funded by the California Air Resources Board to evaluate whether in fact, these Sierra lakes were being uh, potentially damaged by these inputs of, um, of solutes coming from human sources. And um, again, more as a tutorial here, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. So what this is plotting is these are averages over a long time period. You can see it's about 20 year time period. And um, A and C is a kind of a strange word. It really means alkalinity. How much material is in that water which can, can neutralize um, an acid substance? And so what you see through time is, is during the winter, the, there's less flow in the stream. This is the um, composition of the outflow of the lake. And then it builds up slightly. And then in the, in the snow melt period, um, the water gets somewhat diluted by the dilute snowpack. And then it rises again in this following summer. So the dotted line is the discharge and the black dots, the black squares are the uh, alkalinity. If we look down at the bottom, we've got other ions. And again, I wanna just emphasize one. These, again, these black squares are nitrate. And if you remember back when I showed you the snow chemistry, the concentration of nitrate in the snow is around two. And these, these are the same units, although with different symbols. And then during, as the snow melts, the concentrations rise quite dramatically. They increase by at least a factor of three or four, maybe even 10 sometimes. So as an ecologist, as a biogeochemist, one wants to think about, well, what's going on? How can you take a really dilute snowpack? You know, everything else is being diluted, right? The snow is really dilute. You'd think that the nitrate would also go down, not up when the, when the snow melts. So this is, now we're gonna go off on a little biogeochemical tangent and, and try to evaluate how, in fact, the, the watershed might produce this effect. 
And, and there's really sort of two hypotheses that are not mutually exclusive. One is basically looking at physical processes, because when snow sits in the, as it does in the Sierra for many months, it goes through a metamorphosis and the ions in the snow, which are embedded in the snow crystals, tend to migrate to the outside of the, of the snow grains. And then as the snow starts to melt, it's almost like a flushing process. In fact, in lab experiments, we knew that about 40% or more of the nitrate came out in the first 10 or 20% of the melt. So you've got this what you might call a, a first flush. The other thing that can happen, of course, is that as the snow is sitting there, there's soil. In the soil, there's um, organic matter. In the organic matter, there's microbial uh, organisms. They can take, they decompose organic matter. They generate ammonium. They convert that ammonium to nitrate. And then as the snow starts to melt, water flows through these uh, shallow soils and it carries the nitrate out into the lake. So you've got a biologically mediated option through sort of soil processes and soil flushing and a purely physical process that we're calling snowpack pollution. Good hypotheses, how do we tell them apart? Well, it turns out um, Jim, Jim Sigmund, who did this work, um, has a pretty sophisticated way of looking at the isotopic composition of the nitrogen in the nitrate molecule and the oxygen in the nitrate molecule. So he's actually looking at the nitrate molecules Isotopic, isotopic composition of the two elements making up the nitrate. And what you see from that um, is that the atmospheric nitrogen, the snow-based snow nitrogen, falls into this, this zone in this bivariant plot. And the soil nitrate is down here, and the stream water is right in between. So basically, what that tells us is that both of those mechanisms are operative. So using a fairly sophisticated analytical method, we get a very clean result, which answers a biogeochemical question of how, where the nitrate comes from that actually gets into the streams. And it's kind of important to know because um, if nitrate were being an atmospheric pollutant, you might expect more to come from the uh, snow or rain. Whereas if it's mostly a natural biogeochemical process in the soil, you expect the soil and nitrate to be dominating. Well, in this area, it's a combination of both. Okay, so um, one last point I want to make um, about solutes is that, um, you know, back to the question of are the Sierra Lakes being impacted by uh, potentially um, acidifying atmospheric deposition? And the bottom line is no. And so I want you to look at the bottom slide here. And so what you're looking at here is how much, relative to how much um, acidifying substance coming in. Uh, like the amount of the water at hydrogen ion concentration or the nitrate or the sulfate, how much neutralizing is generated by the watershed itself? And it turns out that it's more than sufficient. So I'm going to skip the, this data slide, which is a bit cumbersome to look at. I'm going to dump to the, the words. And basically what, it, what we're going to look at the bottom words first, that what keeps the Sierra Nevada from being affected by even the slight amount of acidic precipitation is the fact that these, these rocks, these granitic rocks and some of the volcanic rocks through a chemical weathering process generate two to five times as much neutralizing capacity expressed as either alkalinity or cations than comes in from the atmosphere. So this was gratifying. In other words, instead of the problem that we were seeing in the East and in, in parts of Europe, the Sierra Nevada was, although subjected to slightly acid rain in the summer, was able to produce by natural weathering enough neutralizing to keep the lakes from becoming acidic. The other thing that we saw was that um, the nitrogen deposition was, a bunch of it was consumed in the watershed as was most of, the, most of the ammonium, because the plants use these as nutrients, um, but not all the nitrate was. And so we're gonna look a little more at, at this nitrate question in a slightly different way. We're gonna start now linking hydrology with um, chemistry. So here we're looking at the amount of, in this case, nitrogen as mostly nitrate, but also other forms, but it's mostly nitrate, retained in the watershed. 
So the higher the, the, the dots that are higher on, in this upper right corner mean that most of the nitrogen that comes in stays in the watershed. As you move to the, to the right, the dots that are down 10 or 20% show that very little of the nitrate is being retained. So what's going on? Well, the bottom axis is the day of the year when the peak snow melt occurred, okay? So in a low snow year, you get snow melt much earlier in the year. So day 160 is about, you know, beginning of June, whereas day 290 is a lot later. Remember those diagrams I showed you showing the discharge from those lakes from the north to the south and how that how long the snow melt occurred. Well, in a big snow year, you get a lot more snow, it takes longer to melt, and therefore there's less time for the plants to take up the, the value, to take up the nitrate. Um, and, and the runoff is more water running through the system. So the downstream fluxes, what comes out the bottom of these watersheds is really different in a high snow year versus a low snow year. So again, now we're starting to see the connections between hydrology, changes in hydrology, and how nutrients like nitrogen moves through these ecosystems. Okay, one more jump in topic. Now we're gonna look at the lakes themselves. Just to remind you that um, in the Sierra, you know, in this altitude in the range from about 2,300 meters to about 3,800 meters. There's over 12,000 lakes and ponds. Most are really quite small, less than a hectare in area. The bottom slide shows a frequency distribution of the areas in, in you know, 10, like 10 to the four square meters, that's one hectare. Um, so that just reminds you there's a lot of lakes up there. Most are pretty small. Emerald Lake, as lakes go, not ponds, ponds are or it's, you know, they tend to be the more ponds and lakes, but there's maybe 3,000 lakes and, and Emerald Lake is kind of right in the median of the lakes, the 3,000 lake sizes. This, this plot shows ponds and lakes combined. So here's a summer picture looking at Emerald Lake. Um, it's about two hectares in area, 10 meters deep. And that weir I was showing you is on the outflow of the stream. So this is, you know, this is why people go hiking in the Sierra, pretty summer conditions. Well, to understand these lakes, we can't just be over there in the summer. We've got to sample year round. So in the winter, this is Emerald Lake. You see this guy standing in the snow. So he's dug, a, dug some snow off the surface. He's then used an ice auger to drill through between two and five meters of ice and slush to get to the water. And then he's going to sample the water underneath. In the springtime, the lake starts to melt, but since there's so much ice and slushy snow on top of it, you get these moats developing. So then the other part of it, so the spring sampling is really, it's really not spring, but this is probably, this could be July some years. Um, so remember these lakes are ice covered from roughly November through May to July. And then the summer conditions, like we showed in that earlier slide, you know. We're looking up the basin, we're looking down the basin. So in the summer, it's a, you know, it's a little lake. But as I remind you that, that most of the year, it's not a little freshwater lake. It's a, it's, it's, it's a snow-covered um, water body. So here, um, just to remind, this is again, um, and we're coming back to the general question I posed in the beginning, are these lakes potentially being affected by uh, atmospheric inputs? So here's a long time series um, over 30 years showing the chemistry of the lake water. Um, and you know, the pH of the lake, you know, the line is kind of around pH six, which is a good, a good value for most aquatic organisms. And this A and C number, this amount of alkalizing potential, again, is around, it's low, but it's normally around 25. But what I want to bring to your attention is during snow melt, you can have pretty low values, you know, almost close to zero. So the lake during, during these really strong snow melt events gets down to not a dangerous pH, but a condition that has almost no ability to neutralize the solutes in the water. But then it bounces back as the um, weathering processes occur. 
So again, this is an example, I would say, for some of you to think about that time series data like this are rare. They're very rare for high elevation lakes. In fact, these are unique for high elevation lakes in the Sierra. But to understand how the, our environment's changing through time, we need these kind of data. We need to know whether there's trends or, or not. Now, in addition to these longer term things, you can also have episodic events that sort of are, that sort of shock the system. And so this top slide, this top image shows that the discharge during a, um, one particular year and it's the snow melt flow out of the creek is, you know, bung up and down as the snow melts and, and um, freezes a little bit every day. But the, the maximum values about uh, in these units are about 500 liters per second. And then uh, when Steve uh, Sadler was up at the lake one summer, in the middle of, in late in the summer, it rained. And, and it was one of these rare thunderstorm type rains. And the discharge went well over 3,000 liters per second, you know, more than seven times what occurred during the maximum snow melt. And when that happens, and these, these kind of rain events is what we're a little bit concerned about because they, they may be increasing as the climate gets warmer. And the metabolism, the, the, the oxygen utilization in the lake totally changed. And instead of producing oxygen and being productive, it got so much organic matter that came in that the lake actually became um, heterotrophic. It actually was consuming more oxygen than it was producing. So this one single event changed the lake's fundamental ecology. But fortunately, because winter then came, and then we got another winter of snow melt, that effect was essentially washed out the next year. So the memory of the lake is relatively short, fortunately. But it is a reminder that, that these abrupt extreme events are increasing and they, have, they can have pretty significant ecological effects. Okay, um, I'm now in the sort of the last piece of this. And I'm gonna, now I'm gonna think more about um, how climate trends or climate variability impinges on these aquatic ecosystems. So this is a time series of um, snow water equivalent and it's expressed as an anomaly. So basically it's a comparison of like the, the zero line means like that's the average over this long period from, 2000, sorry, from 1910 to 2016. Now we only have data from Emerald Lake from the early eighties so we used another snow course and we did some statistics to be able to reconstruct the snow coming into the Emerald watershed over this whole time period. And the green bars are ones that are high snow years and the, the reddish bars that are going down are years with um, especially low snow years and the gray bars sort of bounce around the median. And so again, just to reiterate what I said before, Variability is the name of the game, but there is a, at least if you believe statistics in this time series, of somewhat of a trend at least dominated by the more recent years of, of less, less snow in the basin. And there's the, the low snow years in the, most, in the last couple of decades have dominated over the high snow years. So that's a trend in, in the snow conditions for, this is again done for Emerald Lake. The other climate variable that we hear a lot about, of course, is air temperature. And um, we've had a meteorological station at Emerald Lake for, since the early 80s. And so the summer air temperatures are showing an upward trend. Uh, the winter ones, the blue dots, slightly less of a trend up. The spring, not a trend. Uh, the blacks are the annual average. So there's an upward trend in air temperature overall in the Emerald watershed. Um, so that's another trend that's associated with climate change. We can, and then again, I want to relate back to the hydrology. So remember, I talked about early big snow years, low snow years, and runoff hydrographs. Well, now we're looking at how the um, lake temperatures respond to these differences in hydrology. So the top panel shows the outflow discharge. You can see in a low snow year. Uh, it starts up and peaks and then drops back down pretty quickly. Whereas in a big snow year, it takes a lot longer for the snow to melt, more water comes out. And not too surprisingly, you might say that in a low snow year, the lake is ice-free longer, there's less water flushing through it, the water isn't 
It's cold snow melt. So the lake temperatures get a lot higher. So if those of you like to swim in alpine lakes, 20 degrees isn't warm, but it's certainly swimmable. Um, whereas in a snow, high snow year, you know, even, even in July, the temperatures are more like 10, eight or 10, which isn't too comfortable to swim in. So again, we've got this now connection between how much snow falls, how much discharge occurs, and how the lake temperatures change. And of course, lake temperature is an incredibly important indicator of metabolic activity for the or organisms that live in these lakes. The fish, the zooplankton, the algae, they all are very temperature dependent. So the whole ecosystem as a function will depend on how these temperatures change. So what's, going, what's been going on over time? Well, I'm now summarizing the air temperature a little different way. This is now expressing the, the rate of, the overall annual rate of heating in the emerald watershed. And this number, I mean, if you think about this a little bit, you know, that's at 0.85 degrees per centigrade per decade. That's actually a really high heating rate. You know, and it's, it's surprisingly high. So the, these high altitude lakes are, being, are experiencing proportionally more warming than we're seeing lower in the state. The other thing that we've talked about a lot, of course, is the, the snow variability. And again, this was reiterates over a slightly shorter time span, this long-term trend with a slight decreasing amount of snowpack present. And then the bottom shows you the annual lake temperatures and the blue year, the blue dots are years with high snowfall. And as I just said in, in a little different way, those years, the snow, sorry, the, the water temperatures stay pretty cold. In the sort of average years, you know, they're still relatively cool. And it's only during these low snow years that we see some evidence of a trend in lake warming associated with um, less input of water and slightly warmer air temperatures. So the bottom line here is that these alpine lakes, although um, in an environment that's experiencing some air temperature warming trends are really dependent on the amount of snowfall and how that impact affects the nutrient supply, the nutrient um, retention, and the air and the lake temperatures that affect the metabolism of the organisms. So we could summarize that by pointing out that long-term change in the Sierra is really related to variability and the trends in snowfall. And although the, there's pretty high rates of air temperature warming, there's no trend, overall trend in lake temperatures because it's so much dependent upon how much snow falls in the basin. So again, back to our earlier theme of that snow being important for us as humans to our economy. It's also the main driver of the ecology, the physical conditions in these alpine lakes. And with that, um, I think I'm more or less on time. And we now, and I think I can, I can stop screen sharing and we can begin to have um, some questions. You can see me better with the lights on. So I'll stop sharing. And other, how do you want to do this, Carol? Do you want to give people who want to speak the first chance or, or do you want to have um, use the chat first? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, I think what we can do is um, just to remind people there's a button on the bottom of the Zoom screen that says Q&A and it'll pop up a little window. And if you'd like to ask a question, you can uh, type your question in there and we'll see it. And if you would rather not type a question and just raise your hand, um, we, can, we can do it that way too. So I'll just, just give uh, John a, a chance to catch a breath here. And um, I do see that we have one hand raised um, from Joey Lorando. Um, and if you're out there and you'd like to ask your question, um, you can go ahead. That's entirely my fault. I pressed that button by accident. I'm sorry. Okay, no worries. Um, okay, so uh, we can move to the Q&A box and the first question is from Kevin K, um, asking about are wildfires affecting sub subsequent snow albedo and then runoff and temperature. Okay, um, 
The short answer would be yes, although, um, you know, in this year, fortunately, we haven't had too much, we don't have, we haven't had too much fire activity affecting the snow, but in, there's some really excellent work done in other parts of the country and other parts of the world showing the very strong impact of um, particles from the atmosphere from dust, mostly dust, but also fires, greatly increase the snow albedo, um, reduce the snow albedo and clearly affect snow melt. So yeah, that's, that's an effect that, um, you know, unfortunately, the, as we have more and more fires, are, is going to be increasingly an issue. So that's a really good example of a, um, another kind of effect that we're anticipating. All right, looks like uh, Tim Brown. Hey, Tim, how's it going? So much good information here. <laughs> Good to have you here, Tim. And then David Shapiro um, has another question. Can you discuss more about evaporative water loss with the increased temperatures, please? Is increased evaporation going to meaningfully decrease water flows? Okay. Um, so re remember that you know, most of the year, the, the watersheds are covered by snow. And in that case, the snow is sublimating. And the temperatures of the snow are typically below zero. Um, and what the main thing driving uh, snow melt, uh, not snow melt, sorry, snow um, sublimation is wind speed and the vapor gradient between the snow and the atmosphere. So drier conditions, higher wind speeds will increase sublimation. Um, air temperature directly is, somewhat less important. I mean, the, and what drives snow melt is mainly the input of solar energy, not air temperature. Now in the summer, um, you know, when we have no snowpack, um, now we have the, the main loss is really more from transpiration by the plants, because even though there aren't that many plants there, they're, they're transpiring. So, um, you know, these high elevation, high elevation systems, I don't, okay, maybe rephrase that. Based on the data we have, we, I, we don't have a, a clear trend in changes in evapotranspiration, but because um, it would really require more than just air temperature changes, right? It would require changes in vapor pressure and wind speed, and how much, how long the snowpack lasts, of course. Okay, thanks. Thanks, John. We have another question. We've got Jeff Dozier out there, a co-author on the book. So um, Jeff is intrigued by the difference between phosphorus and nitrogen and the wet versus dry deposition and wants to know where there are differences among the size distribution. The idea is that finer sizes would have less dry deposition than larger particles. Okay, Jeff. Um... So the now you're gonna you're gonna tap my memory in a way that I can't give you a good answer. As I showed in that picture, you know the the, uh, the this was a master student at UC Riverside, um, Will Vickers, that did that work, and he he did size fractionate the phosphorus as as that slide showed into multiple size fractions, and and I'm gonna have to um, say I'll send you the data because I don't remember how this phosphorus was distributed among the different particle sizes. But it's, it's, a, it's a really good point, a good question. All right. And uh, John, I, I have one last question for you, which is um, where, where, do you, where do we sit right now this year, do you think, relative to uh, all those different snow years you've been presenting? Oh. <laughs> And so we, we would expect the lakes to the snow to leave. Well, you, and if you look out your window, Carol, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the, where there, you know, there's not much snow up there, you know? Yeah. And so we're going to have a, you know, earlier melt and warmer lakes. And um, yeah, so it's, I mean, we're on, you know, if, if you look at those and those anomalies we were showing, well, this would be one of the years that um, would be a, a low anomaly year. And so the, all the things that we saw happening with warmer temperatures, longer growing season, um, more nitrogen retention would all be going on. 
All right. Well, let's hope we're going to get a, a, a better snow year next year. Let's hope for that. Yeah. I mean, that's um, another question from Sally to everyone. John, the trend in winter air temperature shows that the line should be, would soon exceed, um, I've missed the last, exceed what? Um, zero degrees. Okay, Sally, mm -hmm. what, I mean, what are you telling me? Which, I mean, the, I'm not following your question, Sally. Should we allow Sally to uh, ask her question here? Yeah, why don't you when, when, why don't you come and ask? Why don't you take your product for our priority? Oh this my gosh, taking, here she this is taking person. smaller. This is taking advantage of uh, familiar relationships. No, I was surprised because I've seen. Oh, that's going to sound funny. Um, bring up your slide that shows the trends in the different seasons. And you can't do that anymore. No. Why don't you ask me separately, okay? Okay. Look. We can't hear you, Sally. You, you know what's happens. going on here? Sally's got a class that's listening, so she's treating this no. like a like a seminar now. And so we're now having a have, cla having an online class. Two professors in the same household. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. John showed me the talk earlier, and I noticed as he gave the lecture now how we're not that far away from zero in the winter temperatures. And I was just so surprised. I mean, you could look at it and say, wow, five years, 10 years. Oh, yeah, okay. You're, now you're asking as the winter temperatures, yeah. the, the average winter temperatures were trending up. Okay, yeah. now I get it. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, got it. Hmm. Okay, no high water problems yet for the PCT hiker crowd. So. Indeed, a low snow year. It, it, truly, true. But yeah. a good year for hiking. <laughs> Until the wildfire so starts. Anyone else? Um, any more questions? One more from Caroline. This might be our last question, John, if you want to take that one. Q&A. I got Jeff's. Carolyn, hi. Um, thinking about have the solutes, that is the cations, the positively charged ions um, in the Sierra protect the lakes from acidification, but not in the East Coast. Is deposition that much higher in the East? Yes, it's much, much higher uh, in the East. Um, remember our, our snow is incredibly dilute. <clears throat> Even the snow in the East has acidic compounds, but it's a lot more rain in the East. So yeah, the deposition is immensely higher um, there, because you're right. I mean, the watersheds have similar rocks in the east as they do here. So the weathering rates are probably, you know, in fact, ours might be lower because we're higher temperature, higher altitude, lower temperatures. But yeah, the deposition rates are much higher. Not just nitrogen, but sulfur in particular. Sulfur from coal burning power plants was a huge effect in the east, east and in Scandinavia. Yeah, you're right on, Carolyn. All right. Well, thank you so much, John. It was great having you present. Thanks, everyone, for attending.